Good worship service this morning, wasn't it? That is a great team. You can have a great team there. All right, thank you for praying for me, Bob. Thank you for the testimony. That was great testimony, by the way. Um, now I take it that the wonderful tech team in the back is going to advance the slides as we go. Uh, uh, why don't we go to the first slide so people, if you want to get our website, if you want to get our YouTube channel, uh, or anything else, the information is on the first slide of the presentation. While they're figuring that out, I want to note that I am uh, somewhat over 40, uh, as are a few others around here, and so they may uh, appreciate uh, this little story here. A couple in their 90s are both having problems remembering things, and so during a checkup with their doctor, he suggested... Uh, that uh, while they're physically okay, they might want to write things down so that it help them remember what they're doing. So later that night, as uh, they are watching TV, the old man gets up from his chair and uh, asks, uh, do you want anything while I'm in the kitchen? His wife says, uh, would you give me a bowl of ice cream? Sure. Don't you think you should write that down so you remember it, she asks? <laughs> no, nah, I can remember that. Well... I'd like some strawberries on top, too. Maybe you should write that down so you don't forget it. No, I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream with strawberries? I'd also like some whipped cream with that. I'm certain you'll forget that, so maybe you want to write it down. He gets irritated. He goes, I can remember that. I don't need to write it down. Ice cream, strawberries, whipped cream. I've got it, for goodness sakes. And off he goes. About 20 minutes later, he comes back, hands his wife a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> she stares at the plate for a moment and finally says, where's my toast? <laughs> <laughs> we forget things. Sometimes we misremember things. Uh, how are we doing on our presentation there? Pardon? Ah, there we are. Ah, I didn't see it. Okay. So that's how you can contact us. Our website, our YouTube channel, our Facebook, our Twitter. If you need that up there a moment, we'll uh, leave that up there uh, before we move along. So Joy and I can identify with this. She tells me, uh, reminds me in fact often, if I go to the refrigerator and I forget why I'm there, I'm probably okay. That's just sort of normal aging. If I go to the refrigerator and I forget what it is, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I think that's true. We have that happen theologically when we talk about issues of faith. Sometimes it's a matter of being untrained and unlearned in Scripture, in understanding what God has said. I really appreciated Ed Havich's talk last night. I always like Ed Havich's talks. He challenges me. And uh, sometimes, uh, and we identify, I identify with a lot of what he does. He had done a talk years ago, I reminded him of this yesterday, where he, was, he, got, he got up and shared about how that he his so wants to reach people for Christ that he would uh, go and learn this new method, surefire method, lead thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses to Christ. And he would go out and he would use it, and that wouldn't work. And so he'd go to another seminar and he would learn another surefire method we lead thousands of people to Christ with this method, and he would learn it, and he would, I mean, he really is a SWAT team. This guy, he spends time memorizing this stuff, and he would go out, and it would fail miserably. And so he started wondering, am I called to even do this kind of a ministry? And then God kind of uh, let him understand that we all use information differently. They hear information differently. There is no silver bullet that works for everybody. Uh, and so, but all of that training comes in handy because at some point you will meet somebody that what you just learned is going to be helpful to. And you learn how to ask questions. So asking questions is important, and we're going to start with, now we, I put the uh, verses in our uh, PowerPoint because I have to be honest, I speak in way too many churches today where people rarely bring a Bible the churches seem to have trained their people away from opening the text of scriptures. They will still, where's she at? 
they will still have the sticky pages in their Bible. That is a terrible thing. They will still have the gold gilt on their Bible. That should be gone, like the movie Gone with the Wind. Matthew 16, 13 through 17. In Matthew 16, 13 through 17, in our talk, Who is Jesus? Jesus poses the question. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, we could spend probably the entire morning just on this passage. We won't. It's a launching point. But there's a number of things that come into this. And... I want to point out that when we are going to a text, any text, including Scripture, we need to understand the context. Very often, when I am working with someone who's a brand new Christian, especially if they've been in a cult or uh, legalistic church of some kind, I have them memorize a little short statement that says a text without a context is a pretext. Repeat that. A text without a context is a pretext. What does that mean? A text, that's what we're reading. Without a context, that's what surrounds it. That is uh, questions like, next slide, who is communicating? What are they communicating? When are they communicating? Who are they communicating to? How would the listener or reader have understood what was said or written. All of that comes into play in order to get an understanding of what is being said. We tend to miss that. Now, it's something that we do normally. If you pick up the newspaper and it says, Donald Trump said, and then you have a quote or whatever, right away, today, we know who Donald Trump is. Love him, hate him, ambivalent about him. You know who he is. He's the President of the United States. Uh, you know who he's speaking to. You know what he's talking about. All of that context is filled in because we just naturally know it living here. The problem with Scripture is oftentimes we try to read it as if it was being written 10 hours ago. Sadly, for too many uh, in our culture, history only started about 14 years ago. It isn't true. So we need to go back into the time. A phrase, a simple phrase like flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. What is he saying? Well, he's not talking about meat on bone. That's important because that comes up again in 1 Corinthians as Paul is talking about the resurrection. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of the earth. It had a particular meaning to the listener. That is, unregenerate humans will not enter the kingdom of heaven. An unregenerate human didn't reveal this to you is what Jesus is saying here. Growing up Jewish in the first century had some particular aspects to it that we missed, but we need to know to understand what this question is about. When you grew up a Jewish, especially as a male, you began memorizing the Tanakh, the Old Testament, at a very early age. And as you grew up, you would be tested by your parents. Uh, do I have this memorized well? And then when you reached... Uh, the time for your bar mitzvah, the very next thing that would happen after your bar mitzvah, today I am a man, uh, you had been learning a trade as you're growing up, usually your father's trade. Now you will go and meet with a local disciple, a local rabbi, and you will be tested. Now they didn't have chapters and verse breaks and all that sort of thing. And so the rabbi, he would ask you a question by quoting a passage of the Old Testament. And you had to answer by quoting the passage directly before or after that passage he quoted. Interesting. So, your response is, here's the question, here's the answer. Here's the question, here's the answer. And we'll go on for a while. At the end of which, the rabbi would say one of two things. 
Either he would say, go and ply your trade, which meant you failed the rabbinical test. Or he would say, come and follow me, which means I'm going to be a rabbi. Now, how does that work itself out? Did you ever wonder why when Jesus came by and he says to, say, uh, uh, James and John, sons of Debedee, come and follow me? What did they do? Immediately dropped their nets and followed him. Doesn't that ever bother you? Well, here's why. What did Jesus find them doing when he came by? What were they doing? They were plying their trade. What does that tell us about the rabbinical test they took? They flunked. Jesus went with a bunch of second stringers. That's kind of a cool thing. And he says, come and follow me. And they immediately dropped their nuts. Why? Because they're going to be rabbis. This is important stuff. And so Zebedee is thrilled about this. He's not unhappy because his sons are going to be rabbis. You can't aspire to anything greater than that. So that is the context of this question. Why do I go and explain that? Because the Son of Man, as Jesus asks this question, a first century rabbi asking a question of his first century rabbinical students, the question has predefined terms that we don't always pick up. Here's where they are. The phrase, son of, carries the idea of being on the order or nature of something. The term son of man occurs 88 times in the New Testament and is used in two ways for Jewish uh, followers. The first is a messianic title, which we find in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where we read, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, he will not, which will not pass away, one his, uh, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. In applying this title to himself, Jesus is claiming several things. One, he has a kingdom. Two, it will last forever. Three, all nations will serve him. The disciples then go on to respond uh, with uh, what others are saying about him, all of which focus on the messianic aspect, the human aspect, that he's John the Baptist, he's Elijah, he's Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They're looking for a deliverer to take them out from the oppression of Roman rule. And so that is what the crowds are looking for. The second definition, which would come to the minds of the disciples, uh, is something that we find in Ezekiel, actually, where Ezekiel is called the Son of Man 93 times. I mean, I'd have realized that. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel. God is simply calling Ezekiel a human, a, or having a human nature, the nature of being human. So the phrase Son of Man indicates that Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah, and he's truly a human being. Peter's response as yet another dimension. Uh, like the phrase Son of Man is saying that Jesus is human, or has human nature, Son of God is saying what about Jesus? He's divine. He has the nature of being God. I suspect, this is just speculation, that the Apostle John was reminiscing on this as some 60 years later when he penned his gospel and the first epistle of John. Because his words are going right at a heretical teaching that had pervaded the church called Gnosticism. It seems that nearly every religion in some way has to include Jesus in their schema, their, their brand of uh, whatever religious faith they are putting forth. And so they want to add something we will call the good Jesus-keeping seal of approval. This 
This was just as true of the Gnostics and other false teachers in the first century as it is today. Gnostic, Gnostics claimed basically two things. Their worldview was something called dualism, which means there's a spirit world, which is good, and a material world, but every aspect of the material world is bad. It is all evil and nothing but evil. The reason the material world is bad is, according to Gnostic beliefs, the original source god emanated other gods, or aeons they called them, who in turn emanated other gods, who in turn emanated other gods. And one of them accidentally emanated a god who was somewhat imperfect, who then created things that are obviously imperfect. And when Jesus was baptized, the Christ emanation descended on the human Jesus. God cannot incarnate according to this because that would mean God is taking on evil and becoming, therefore, evil. So their whole idea is matter is evil. We can do whatever we want to it. On, on one end of the spectrum, they would beat themselves, torture themselves, wear hair shirts, whip themselves. Uh, I, won't go, I was going to start comparing it to some religious groups that sort of do that spiritually, but... Uh, they were always tormenting themselves to perfect themselves because matter is evil and all that matters is spirit. The, on the other end, and, and Paul writes about that, by the way, in Colossians, about those who uh, torment themselves. And, and they have the seeming uh, view, the seeming uh, ability to be spiritual. The other end of the spectrum was since matter is evil and since all that matters is spirit, we can live any way we want. And they could have orgies and, you know, big food feasts and all sorts of things. Because whatever we do in the body doesn't matter. So John is correcting false teaching in the first century, late first century, around 90 AD. Probably has this passage, this exchange in mind as he's writing these words. Uh, in 1 John 1, 1 through 3 where he's, oddly enough, pointing back to Genesis 1. John 1, 1 through 3 is pointing the reader back to Genesis 1. Why is that? Who did the creation? God. Was the creation good or bad? Good. That's what it says in the text. So John is taking the reader back Back to Genesis 1 to get a grasp about who it is that we are talking about. And he pens these words. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now without even getting into all of the language questions... All we need to do is say, okay, he's pointing us back to Genesis 1. What do we read there? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. It's a, it's a compelling comparison because we now understand who the creator is, and he is uncreated, according to John. And then he makes his case in, chapter, in the first chapter as he writes in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now remember, Gnostics say God could not become material, right? What did John say here? We have what? Seen. We saw it. Our physical eyes were physically seeing Jesus, the Son of God, who is God, who created everything. That's what this whole chapter is, is uh, telling the, the reader about. The entire claim in these verses was very easy for the reader to understand. One, the word, the logos, is God. The Word, or the Logos, is face-to-face -face with God. 
Whenever the beginning was, the word already existed. There wasn't anything that predated him. Everything which was created was created by him. In fact, it's interesting, the New World Translation makes it even better than most translations you read, the older ones, where it says, not even one thing was created that he didn't create. How many things? None. We draw a line on the paper. We read on one side. Created, creator. Which side does Jesus go on? Jehovah's Witness. You have to decide because he can only go on one. If it's created, he created it. If he didn't create it, it isn't created. So tell me, if he's created, how did he create himself if he didn't exist? What does that look like? It's a fun question. And like Ed, I love questions. They are too fun. I have a thing I was talking with someone last night that I, I kind of like to do, and I call it a question on a Danish. I float a question out there. I don't care if they answer it. Float a question out there and take the pressure off. Would you like a Danish? It's like a cup of coffee. Because I don't have to answer the question. It needs to roll around in their brain. The Holy Spirit will use that. It's not my job to bludgeon people into the face. I, I just have to kind of keep my wits about me and ask the right next question and then go on my merry way. I, uh, I kind of like it. I, 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 an analogy I used to use is, uh, is evangelism by judo. I love judo, right? Because someone reaches out to punch you with an argument. And all you really have to do is step back slightly, take a hold of their arm, and help them continue on their journey till they hit the floor. Right? It's much easier. It's less wear and tear on me. I don't have to get upset if we don't agree because it's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. But I do want to keep it in context, right? 1 John 1, 1 through 3, he resumes this dialogue addressing false teaching in the church. Now, I would like to say that... Uh, we don't really have a problem with false teaching in the church today, but I would be lying. <laughs> so many of the things we read, in fact, as I talk with a variety of people, they want to tell me that they want to get back to the first century church, this, you know, pristine faith, which never actually existed, where everyone believed everything exactly correctly. And I have to ask them, have you actually read the New Testament? And they go, what do you mean? I go, there's not a book in the New Testament that wasn't written to correct error. Romans was written to correct error. First and Second Corinthians was written to correct error. Galatians was written to... Now you're kind of getting that, right? Each book was written to correct error. Why? Because false teachers rose up in the church. That has been a problem from the first century and it continues with us today. So, John writes in 1 John 1, 1 through 3, that which was from the beginning, sound familiar with this gospel? Which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify it to you uh, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was in the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Next slide. Let's take a moment and kind of take this apart, phrase by phrase, in the context it was intended to for the first century. That which was from the beginning... The word beginning is arche. It's a Greek word which has an idea of origin, source, initial starting point. It may deal with time, but largely it has more to do with preeminence. So that which was from the beginning or that which has preeminence, the origin or source of everything, that's what we're talking about. He says which we have heard. We audibly listened to him with our physical ears. 
we heard him. Sound waves were being transmitted from his lips and they were coming to our ears. That he was a physical being that we saw and heard. Now, I don't know that uh, Charles Stanley, the elder of Charles Stanley, uh, oftentimes would say something now, listen, listen, listen. He wants that you should get what he's talking about. John's doing the same thing here, which we have seen with our eyes. We clearly saw him physically with our physical eyes. And we looked upon him. Do you see the repetition in his language? We clearly saw him physically with our physical eyes. We looked closely. We gazed admiringly at him. It wasn't just a passing glance. We stared at him. We have touched him with our hands. We touched, we handled, we rubbed. We were in close physical contact with his physical body, with our physical hands. He was not a spirit. He was physically with us. The life was made manifest. So this life appeared and could be seen. And, next slide, and we have seen it. Are you getting the point? I think John would say. We testify to it. We charge. We give evidence. We bear record. Proclaim to you. We announce. Cause you to hear. Bring you a report. Testify. We want you to clearly understand what we're saying. Which was with the Father. Jesus was forward or toward or in the same direction. They were face to face with one another. He was made manifest to us. This life appeared, could be seen by us. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him, we ate with him, we walked with him, we bumped into him on the road, we joked around with him. We did all of those kinds of things that you would do with another human being. And he says the word statement again, which we have seen. We clearly saw him physically with our physical eyes. And heard. We audibly listened to him with our physical ears. We proclaim also to you. We announce, cause you to hear, bring you a report or testify. In this short passage, John writes that they saw or looked upon Jesus four times. And that they heard him twice. To what end, you might ask? That you might believe in the real Jesus. Not a Gnostic Jesus. Not one with the Jesus seal of approval on it. Not a made-up Jesus by a false religious group. But by the one that we saw, we touched, we ate with, we walked with, we cried with, we We watched being crucified. And then we embraced him when he was resurrected. In that Jewish dialect, he might say something. We want you should believe in the real Jesus. To the end that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Well, do Mormons believe in Jesus? Almost universally, I would ask that question, people would say no. And then I'll have some un, uh, uh, Christian who's unaware of what Mormons teach call me in a panic and say, just talk with Mormons. And they believe in Jesus. And they say, he's even in the name of our church. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Of course they believe in Jesus. And in fact, they said, he's God. They said he took on human form. So I believe that. And uh, that he was sinless. And our church teaches that. And he was crucified. And that's what we believe. And uh, he was resurrected. And we believe he was resurrected. And, 
And, and they even said we're saved by grace. And you said there's teach that we're saved by works. Sounds like they're teaching the same thing that our churches teach. To add confusion to all of this discussion, in 1997, InterVarsity Press, by the way, just because it's a Christian publisher doesn't mean they're publishing Christian books. Be aware. Published How Wide the Divide by Evangelical Professor Craig Blomberg, who's generally a good professor, but missed the boat on this one, in my opinion, and LDS professor Stephen E. Robinson. And on page 195, they have 12 affirmations, which the authors state, quote, we jointly and sincerely affirm the following foundation propositions of the Christian gospel as we both understand it. Number one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one eternal God. Doesn't that sound like they believe the same things we believe? Well, what they're going for is that good Jesus keeping seal of approval. And all of these groups try to do that, including Wicca, by the way. Name a group. Hinduism. I was, I was, <laughs> sometimes we take groups who are learning apologetics through various venues so they can see what uh, people actually do and practice in various faiths. And so we took a group through a Hindu temple one time. This is great fun. Uh, and uh, they're talking about the different incarn incarnations of Vishnu as they're going through this. Uh, and I usually hang back. I, I, I want to wait, because there's going to be a question I'm going to be able to ask. And I, I just, they'll only let me do this once, so I want to make it a good one. And so I'm, I'm kind of hanging back, and we go through the whole tour, and there's some other people not affiliated with the group that are part of the tour as well. They're just kind of checking out maybe they want to become Hindus, right? And so we get all the way to the end, and, and someone said, was well, Jesus an incarnation of Vishnu? And uh, the uh, leader goes, oh, yes, he was one of the... One of the. And I said, I have a question. He said, yes. I said, would one incarnation of Vishnu lie about all the other incarnations of Vishnu? Oh, no, it's not possible. Well, Jesus said he was the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Therefore, all other incarnations are false. Is that true? And he stood there, and he stared at me, and he turned bright red. And he said, Jesus lied, and he turned and walked away. All right. The good Jesus seal, keeping, uh, keeping seal of approval, just sort of vanished before their very eyes. Because you have to just ask the right question in the right way. So, is it true that we agree with Mormonism? It isn't where we are similar that is the problem. It is where we disagree that is most important. Our friend Dr. Ron Rhodes often says, when you're looking at the world religions, where everyone wants to argue that they all only appear the same on the outside, but when you follow the spoke down, they're all the same in the middle, that's not true. They only appear the same on the outside. When you follow the spokes down, what you find is they are all radically different where they uh, come to the center. Here's where we differ. Jesus and us, we're born on another planet near the star Kolob to a Mormon god and one of his many Mormon wives. His task and his existence is to keep them eternally pregnant. This would definitely be a man's religion. God the Father had sexual relations with his daughter, Mary, to provide a physical body for his son, Jesus. Jesus then took on a physical body to earn his godhood. Salvation and eternal life are different. For us, they are synonyms. For Mormons, salvation is the opportunity to be resurrected. Eternal life is the opportunity to become gods or goddesses of your own planets. So it isn't the word they use, it is how they define the word. It is the context. Remember that a text without a context is a Pretext. A pretext is something that sounds true, but in fact is false. So, uh, as uh, Lorenzo Snow, fifth president of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said, next slide, 
As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. We are merely gods in embryos. And we are working our way toward godhood. I forgot to put, yeah, as God once was. Yep. Um, next one. Do, more, do uh, Muslims believe in Jesus? What do you think? Some? Yeah, you got, you're getting, you're following me, right? Yeah. Yeah, they do. He was born of a virgin, according to Islam. He was, uh, his birth was miraculous. Uh, he was sinless. He performed miracles. He ascended bodily into heaven. In fact, uh, the miracles is something I like to use when I'm talking with Mormons because we want to really know who the greater prophet is. Wouldn't you rather follow the greatest prophet? Uh, and Muhammad said he performed no miracles. And uh, the Quran shows Jesus performing many miracles. So we can use their material. What was that? Their material? I, he I heard that in this testimony. Use their material. right? Use the Quran and demonstrate against them. Okay. Next one. Here's where we differ. And this is why this is important. Islam denies that Jesus is the son of God or that the father would even beget a son. Jesus, according to them, was created. The Trinity is rejected claiming that Allah has no partners. Yes, Jesus was sinless, but that's no big deal because guess what? All of the prophets are sinless. Jesus wasn't crucified, and therefore, he wasn't resurrected. Salvation is by works, following the five pillars of Islam. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Of course, you all know the doctrine here, and so your first... Uh, Response would be, yes, Jesus created the universe, even as a Jehovah's Witness, right? Jesus was sinless. Wouldn't a Jehovah's Witness affirm that? Of course. Jesus was born of a virgin. Would a Jehovah's Witness affirm that? Yeah. He was crucified. They would affirm that. But where do we differ? See, it always comes down to where we differ. What do you mean by these terms? My wife and I, and we're married 47 years this year. We've known each other 50 years this month. And uh, she kind of knows that I, when she tries to communicate something to me, I need definition. Because I don't speak woman. I, I just... I, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again, just, just to kind of reiterate that. So guys, listen closely, because you don't speak woman either. When we dated, she asked me, do you want to go shopping? Now, I have a definition for that. It involves getting in my car, going to, at that point, J.C. Penney. It's parking fourth, fifth spot from the door. I know which door it's going to be. We're going to walk into the women's section where she's going to buy a blouse, whatever size and color, I don't know. Back in the car, off we go. 18 to 22 minutes, we're done. Her definition was somewhat different. What she was saying is, do you want to go shopping? We're going to drive to the mall, park wherever. We're going to go in, whatever door doesn't matter. We're going to wander around from store to store. We're going to look in windows. We may not buy anything. We're going to sit down and buy a Coke. Could be there two, three hours. Because we're having a relationship. See, I'm doing a task. She's having a relationship. At 23 minutes, I'm going, I'm ready to go. What's going on here? She hadn't bought a dress. We, don't, we're, we haven't even made it to J.C. Penney yet. What is going on here? Right. Definitions are really important in relationships, and they're really important in talking about who Jesus is. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to go back to, uh, to Ed. He is absolutely right. We're not trying to get someone to a church, to an organization, to a group. We want to get them one place. That's to Christ, right? If they are in Christ, it's all good. If they are not in Christ, everything else is wasted. The directions are important. Where we differ for those who are watching and unfamiliar, Jesus was created for Jehovah's Witnesses as Michael the archangel, who in turn created everything else. Michael ceased to exist, and then God created a human Jesus plugged Michael's electricity into the human Jesus, downloaded some of the memories of the pre-incarnate 
Michael into the human Jesus, and voila, you have a new being. Who then lived 33 years approximately, died, and after the crucifixion, according to the watchtower, Jesus is dead forever dead. But created another Michael to replace him. Downloaded the memories from the previous Michael and Jesus into the newly created Michael who has no connection whatever with the other two except they share electricity. Salvation is by organizational affiliation. There are other groups who teach that, by the way, the Roman Catholic Church. Salvation is by organizational affiliation. Uh, there's a number of groups that hold that view. Definitions are important. When we die, Jehovah creates a replacement for us. That is a really powerful kind of a question to ask Joy, and I have loved that. She has a little story she uh, tells sometimes to people to make them understand this. My daughter had a, a cat. We, we named Mr. Kitty. I loved Mr. Kitty. Mr. Kitty was kind of like a rag doll. He was great. He had great personality. And, and he, laid, he would lay between Joy and I, and I would pick him up, and he would sit with me. And then when, when she would come in the living room, she'd hold out her hand, and I'd lift him up and like a rag doll and hand him to her. And Mr. Kitty just had personality. Everyone loved him. And so they were talking one day, and, and uh, my daughter said, you know, what if Mr. Kitty dies? I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and Joy said, well, if, if Mr. Kitty dies, we'll just get you another kitty. And uh, she goes, yes, but they wouldn't be my Mr. Kitty. And so there's this teaching kind of plugs into Joy's brain at the time. She goes, well, well but what if we got a, a, a cat that looked like Mr. Kitty? And she said, well, that wouldn't be my Mr. Kitty. And she said, well, okay, but what if we got a cat that looked like Mr. Kitty and thought he was Mr. Kitty? But it wouldn't be my Mr. Kitty. And that's the point. It wouldn't, doesn't matter what it thought. It wouldn't be the original cat. And so we had an elder over, and we went through some, some of their documents just asking questions. You know, is this what you believe? Is this what you believe? Yes, 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 yes. And so Joyce said, I'm puzzled. If Jehovah could create you with all of your memories right up to this moment in time, could he create you right now as a duplicate? And he said, oh, he wouldn't do that. She goes, well, that's not my question. I'm not saying what he would do. I'm saying... Could he create a new you, a replacement you, say in the hallway, uh, and then, you know, we could march him in, we could say, okay, your replacement here, shoot you between the eyes, and you would be okay with that because then your new you would be here, and he could go home and sleep with your wife and play with your kids, and wouldn't that be just a fine thing? He got really upset. I don't know why, because that's what they believe. But they only believe it because there's a time span between the original and the replacement. And we went on and said, but, you know, that's really okay because, yes, it really won't be you that's sleeping with your wife and playing with your kids because it's not really your wife and kids. It's a duplicate of them, right? We have the, the, uh, the planet of the clones here is what we have. Uh, the original you is not there. Definitions are important. Untaught and undiscerning Christians, uh, some of, of the confusion is the result of too little teachings on the essentials of the faith and or too little study on these issues by individuals. Sometimes they could be in a good Bible teaching church, but they pay little attention while they are there, just putting in their hour on Sunday morning and spend more time watching Christian television, reading occult books and whatever. Uh, to be really influenced by the Word of God. Some lack discernment due to Christian media airing teachers who are heretical on the nature of God themselves. Kenneth Copeland, who stands up and says, God created an exact duplicate of himself. If you stood God next to Adam, you would not be able to tell the difference. They were both about six foot tall, a couple hundred pounds more or less, and God has a nine-inch hand span, and he created the universe with a nine-inch hand span. And they go, and you allow that to be on so-called Christian television? Benny Hinn, who stands up at his pulpit when he was pastoring in Florida, and says, you don't come to this church to hear the same thing you've heard for the last 50 years. God told me that God the Father has a body, soul, and spirit. 
God the Son has a body, soul, and spirit. God the Holy Spirit has a body, soul, and spirit. There are nine of them. And nobody got up and walked out of the church. Undiscerning Christians, like the first century, didn't ask the right questions and didn't hold their teachers accountable. As a friend, Laurie McGregor, often says, if you have the right Jesus, you are right for eternity. But if you have the wrong Jesus, you are wrong for eternity. And as the Apostle John pens in 1 John 2, 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. If you have the wrong Jesus, you have nothing. If you have the right Jesus, you have everything. It never says you have to believe the Father's God to, to be born again. Do you realize that? Never says you have to believe the Holy Spirit's God. Doesn't say you have to believe the Trinity. It says one thing. You have to believe that Jesus is Yahweh to be saved and if you don't believe that, you don't have the Son or the Father. Now, I want to tell you, we're going to end. We have a couple minutes. This is good. Uh, what, after I became a believer, I was driving down uh, one of our expressways in Chicago and uh, listening to Moody Radio, and a preacher came on. And I wanted to do this today, but I realized I don't have the cadence or the delivery style uh, and I don't think I could get through it if I had either one. Because it just so gripped me as I heard it the first time I had to pull over and not drive until I could kind of get over my emotional breakdown. And I, there's not a lot that gets me emotionally broken down, but every once in a while something pops up, and this is one of them. It's uh, uh, the late preacher S.M. Lockridge. Uh, cool name for a preacher, Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. And he is going to tell you. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? <laughs> My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. 
His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen.